happy to, there we go. Great. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Libraries in Response. This is session 80 in our series that's been running since the pandemic was declared in March of 2020. And we're happy to have you back. And we're also happy to have new friends, new participants for the first time. We see we are a number of them. Uh, we are the, uh, let me get the slide up. Not my email. High speed reverse of the slideshow. Uh, this is session 80, Conversation with the Caterpillar. Who are you? A great opportunity AI presents librarians, according to uh, David Lankus, our David Lankus, our featured speaker today and returning speaker. David's been with us several times as we've pursued this very topic. And we're grateful he's made time to come back with us today. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network, uh, open collaboration of uh, tech using tech innovating libraries around the world. And uh, we are hosted and recorded today by the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA. Uh, with Stephen Weiber, the head of public policy for IFLA at the controls somewhere on the planet. And our sponsor is uh, IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, which has happily come in to support this series. Thank you, IMLS. Uh, this is our, our kind of go-to metaphor for libraries these days, the Swiss Army knife of public institutions. They do more for more people, more services, for more people than any other institution by, by a lot. And that's both a wonderful thing because they're so flexible, but it's a difficult thing. It's a challenge for them to make a specific case for their value and what they do, unlike other institutions like hospitals and schools and so forth, which have very defined narrow charters. Libraries are wide open. Whatever their communities, typically their community institutions, want them to do, they can do. Get rid of all the books, have nothing but books, have seminars on goat roping or, you know, anything. It's just wide open. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, institution. Our focus since we started this has been on uh, response to, well, of course, the COVID crisis, but very various crises that have come along since then. Uh, it, it has really been a cascade since 2020, just kind of nonstop. There was, of course, COVID and the climate is, the, you know, the overarching crisis, uh, which is a hard thing to accept, given there are so many other pressing challenges. AI, which we'll get into today, and and now war is a new, a new one. It hasn't affected most of us yet, but... Uh, COVID, and it's still here. It keeps coming back. It's one, one migration from, you know, being even more serious again. But there are tens of millions of people still suffering from it, from long COVID, a really hideous kind of version of it. Uh, the climate change, inevitable and irreversible. I mean, that's, that's tough news, but that's where we are. Uh, AI boon or doom. This was the uh, title of our last session on on AI, and uh, a lot of people are freaking out about it uh, with good reason, or is it you know just the uh, the next kind of bubble tech fad? Perhaps more than that. Uh, and and war. I mean, it's, it's not quite like Alexandria yet, but. We're seeing signs around uh, uh, about uh, challenges to libraries' very existence. So we've decided to just put them all together here. Let's just get the gang all in place. 
Um, this is a great illustrator, uh, Cal, with uh, this very effective uh, combination of what the planet's facing. We were, we were all kind of uh, relaxed about we only faced nuclear annihilation. So now we have all these. Uh, it looks like the, the modern version of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Maybe it is. Uh, there is uh, coming up a session uh, November the 2nd with Joe Hillis, uh, the, the operations director for ITDRC, which uh, is an organization, an all volunteer organization will come out and help you restore communications if you lose it in any kind of outage, any kind of a disaster or just any outage. It's, they have like a couple of thousand very smart, very capable uh, technical people that, that belong to this organization and, and they deploy all over the country wherever something happens. They are pretty much U.S. based uh, at, at the moment, but just put this in your calendar and definitely they should be on your Rolodex because when it does happen, this is just exactly the kind of support you need. So uh, to the session and David, uh, welcome back, David. It's great to have you as always. Your, your, your verb, your illumination are uh, wonderful inspirations for us. And if I can stop sharing here. Go. Yeah, you know, thank you, Don. Yeah, I think you, you got it. Um, I really appreciate uh, the invitation and I always appreciate the opportunity just to have a conversation. Um, Don, what you got what you do with this program about finding important issues and salient factors and interesting people? I'm honored to be of the group. Um, so he reached out to me, we were having a conversation. I'd given a presentation. I'm going to use the slides again today, though. I'm guessing that the actual conversation will be a bit different around librarianship and AI. It's, I was commenting to some other folks that, um, these days when I'm invited to speak in classes or to groups, or whatever, it's either about book banning or AI. Um, and these days, I'm in, I'm actually seeing an interesting connection between those things in many ways, uh, and we'll talk about that again today. Um, because one of the the things that we'll also talk about today is that I've seen the response to artificial intelligence. I see Stephen is is on the on the Zoom, um, and if you haven't, or please take advantage of all the work he does on on his lighthouse because he's doing a great job of tracking a lot of these topics, but. One of my things that I saw was interesting, librarians are, I think, responding very positively towards AI. In other words, we, we tend to go through the existential crisis mode about how the internet, and CD-ROMs, and all these other things are going to put us out of business. And I haven't seen that with AI. I've seen that librarians have been very positive in thinking about engaging it, how it can play, where it can be, et cetera. Um, and so it's been, it's been rather reassuring. And I think that there is hope for optimism. And I were just chatting briefly before we hit record about the previous session we did is sort of boon or doom. And, and I said, so where are we? He goes, I think you're saying boon today. I said, today's boon. So with that, let me just throw these up. And, and like I say, as we go through them, I'm watching the chat. Um, if you want to jump in, happy to, to have the conversations about what's going on. Um, so this is uh, where we're going to start. Really, it's librarianship and AI. And I, I started this presentation uh, with a personal anecdote. This is uh, an AI-generated image of a chimera, which is a mythological creature that consists of multiple animals. Normally, it's a lion and a goat and a serpent. In this case, they've decided to add wings and such because it's pretty. Um, but I've had a, the idea is that it's a sort of multi or original beast thrown together. The reason I bring it up actually is because I am a chimera. In biology, chimera indicates a biological system that has two different DNA systems as part of it. And as part of my cancer treatments many years ago, knock on fake wood, um, I received a bone marrow transplant uh, from a donor. And uh, it's actually my son. 
And what that means is that I have two different DNA systems. If you were to take a swab out of my mouth for saliva, you would find one DNA. If you were to take a blood sample, you'd find another, which is why if I ever commit a major crime, I'm leaving blood evidence so that they will in fact um, arrest my son. That's just where we are. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's an interesting place to be. And the reason I bring this up is if I didn't tell you that and you were just looking or talking or watching other videos, you'd have no idea. Right? I don't take any special medications for it. I don't do anything sort of different. It just is. And so even though my blood is completely different and I'm alive because of a completely different organ, on the exterior, it looks the same. The reason I bring this up besides, you know, looking for, hopelessly looking for sympathy for my audience is that really, I think right now we're in a state where our knowledge infrastructure, that is how we learn about the world, is, in, is like a chimera. We think it's one thing. It appears to be one thing. It doesn't seem radically different. But if you look at the inner systems and how it's functioning, it is very, very, very different. And so um, where this comes in is that we talk about AI as if it just appeared 11 months ago with ChatGPT. And by the way, that was 11 months ago. But in truth, AI has already profoundly changed how we come to know the world, which is just where this fancy word knowledge infrastructure comes from. Knowledge infrastructure is just a way of thinking about the people that we learn from, talk to, understand, see, um, the technology we use to have those interactions and those conversations the sources that we are accessing with these technologies and these days with the people, and then policies that control that. What are we allowed to access? Not everything from copyright to password protection, to encryption, to et cetera. So, and this isn't just how we learn. This isn't formal learning. This is literally how we know the world, right? We talk to our spouse. We talk to our friends. We talk to our family. Um, we talk to bosses. We do this via Zoom, in person, et cetera. It really is how we sort of see how the world is going. And in all of these structures, artificial intelligence has already really changed how we do things. Before ChatGPT and before we were able to create all these AI images and such, it was already there. I'm a big Spotify fan. I listen to music all the time. I love having sort of a, a running um, soundtrack to my life. And so it's my, my most used application. But what next song I hear what song comes after a playlist is finished. And even using virtual DJs, that's all generated through AI techniques, using natural language processing, using different inverted um, neural networks, et cetera. The music I listen to and literally get exposed to and think about, and it affects my moods, AI is driving that. And it's not just Spotify, if you're listening on Amazon or Apple Music or whatever, it's happening, right? If you're on YouTube, the next video is coming from the same techniques out of AI. We talk about algorithms all the time, the algorithm, how Facebook decides what your next post is or what next horrible thing Elon Musk does to X or what have you. But those are increasingly AI-driven systems. They're non-deterministic systems. They're based on patterns. They're based on automated human-like decision-making. In education, what we see with the new lesson. Um, right now, Khan Academy is working on using AI as a virtual tutor so that they can not just give answers, but help people come to answers. In research, I was talking with a group of friends and we're like, we want to do this study and we're going through the study. And we're talking about what's the research question and we move a little bit. What's the research question? And then one of my colleagues just sort of disappeared for a moment, came back on and said, I think we're out of a business. Can I share my screen? He shared his screen. There was ChatGPT where he says, what is the research question around? And it did a good job of weighing them out. I mean, yeah, we well, want to edit them, but they're really good. We're already seeing the National Science Foundation pulling people together to talk about how AI can run laboratory experiments, how it can be allow a researcher to do the deep thinking and AI will handle some of the basic stuff. So we're seeing this in gaming. We're not, we're getting smarter and smarter bosses. We're getting smarter and smarter algorithms to entice and to use the game and to give different rewards. In movies, we're seeing right now, we're on you know two major strikes in Hollywood around the writer's strike and the ongoing actor's strike are around AI and using AI to generate scripts, but also using AI to generate animations, graphics, movies, um, publications, military, everywhere we're seeing. And so we may be going on as if we did 10 years ago, but AI is influencing all of those in a very transparent way. 
And so a lot of the current conversation is around generative AI. And to me, it's the face that's now emerging. That is, it's always been there, but now we're seeing it directly. We're seeing AI take on things that we thought were human only processes of writing and image creation and such. And I will argue, I'll make this you know, radical statement that frankly is the safest statement I've ever made, which is generative AI will have a large or larger impact on publishing than the web. Um, we, there was a, I was part of a 75th anniversary for our school and we had a great speaker, um, Stephen from Kung Fu AI. And he said, you know, it's like 1997. At the beginning of 1997, the question was, are we going to live in an internet world or are we going to keep using our fax machines, right? Are we going to keep with this infrastructure and point to point and such, or is the internet going to change things? By the end of 1997, into 1998, that question was answered, right? It was, the, it was, we were all in on the internet. One reason or another, we were going that way and it's just gone that way. And we're sort of at that point now. And I think we're at the point now where we're going to talk about at the beginning of 2023, are we going to be in an AI generated world or are we going to be sort of in more traditional human mediated systems? And I'm thinking by the end of this year, that conversation will be done and it will be AI that we see already integrated in lots of different ways. There are many caveats to come. But the point is we're seeing this trend on a regular basis. We're seeing this very much around artificial intelligence and conversations around libraries and publishers, right? We know, this is back to that Chimera thing. Well, I've talked to many librarians and I've talked to people, library directors and in different institutions. And they're like, well, we're really waiting to see. We're, we're not quite there yet. We're not, we're, we're not quite to the point of thinking about how this is gonna happen. And the answer is it's happened. <laughs> it already has happened. AI generated content. I used, I mean, this is like two months ago, I put the slide together. So I just changed it to AI generated content is in your library collections. We saw Amazon have to uh, limit the number of books that individual authors could submit to three a day because generative AI was just cranking out publications and putting them up. But even I'm working on a book right now and I'm using generative AI. It's not writing the book, but it when I get stuck with phraseology or how do I address this, whatever, a good generated paragraph or two helps me to go in and edit and refresh and think about what I'm doing. So while that book will have me as the author and I will take credit and I will take liability for those words, AI was part of generating those texts, right? How will we recognize this? How will we catalog these things? How will we distribute texts and such? And what's interesting is when we ask those questions about how you're going to recognize AI generated content, the answer is normally using AI content generators to look at them or creating metadata around it, how we're distributing them. Who advocates um, and educates the communities that we're a part of, right? So we know that, you know, one of the big questions, and I'll get to this in a second, is you know, AI and automation in general, because that's sort of taking that track, has already had a massive impact on our workforce. Once again, talking about the other strikes that are going on with UAW and talking with our auto workers in the United States, that idea that yes, they're fighting against electric cars and such, but at the bottom line of the electric vehicle and electric distribution systems are AI algorithms that drive mileage and charging percentages and interfaces and navigation and such. It's intertwined. Where will the curated quality of data come from AI? So um, Don mentioned the, the Vanity Fair article, which is well worth the read. And it comes into something like this. ChatGPT, we'll use text for a moment, we'll move to images in a second, but ChatGPT in particular, they're built um, on all text it can find on the internet. And what the Vanity Fair piece puts beautifully is they call it the pile and in it there's something called book three, where in essence, some folks took every ebook they could get their hand on, copywritten, copyrighted or not, and turned it into plain text and then fed it into the AI algorithms. Trained ChatGPT and the other large language models on how to write correctly and how to generate human inference and human eh, is based on copywritten material, copyrighted materials, as well as all this other stuff. And the publishers, including the New York Times and um, publishing houses. Now authors are looking at this and saying, this is unfair. They're saying it in the form of this is a violation of copyright, which we can talk about because the question is maybe. 
Um, but they're saying this is unfair. And so what we've seen is the first sort of shots across the bow. So New York Times put up a new um, use statement, acceptable use statement, and there are different agreements to get at their content. And one of them was, thou shalt not use our content to chain AI. Well, that might seem sort of, okay, sure, they do that. Okay, sure, I can see the publishers do that. And we can talk, and I'm happy to talk about how this was the same kind of conversation that happened around search engines, when instead of talking about generated content, they were talking about excerpts and when it was brought back in Google and was Google allowed to index sites and et cetera. And there was the same sort of conversation about, is this a transformative work? Is this a copyright violation? How does that fit? We're about to have that conversation now, but this is why it matters so much. This is from Business Insider and Business Insider um, talks about a study. The study came out of the University of Washington and a California university. I'm, I'm blanking on it. Might have been Berkeley, might have been Stanford. And they, this is direct quotes. The authors settled one important question, the authors of this study. AI models rely heavily on high quality human generated content that is often under copyright. And this is my favorite journalistic quote of the year. Without that, performance begins to suck hard. Quote, as we show model performance significantly degrades if trained only on low risk tasks, e.g. out of copyright books or government documents due to its limited size and domain coverage, they wrote. In essence, what's happening is if we begin to remove all the great human generated, often under copyright texts, as we get rid of good journalism, as we get rid of good research, as we get rid of good writing, as we pull these out of the models, these models will begin to suffer. The real issue though, isn't that the models suffer. It's like, oh, too bad. But the real issue is, they will continue to generate content and text. It just won't be informed by these things. So it'll be informed by all the other stuff out on the internet that we know is vetted and high quality and kind of scary. So this is the point that we're in. And all content, you know, this is the idea that we, we begin to talk about and publishers are just looking at this as an existential crisis and I don't disagree with them. This is, they're having the same moment that the internet brought to libraries, which is, oh, do we, are we still needed? Does Google do our job? How does this happen? And it's having profound effects now. It's not having them in the future. It's not a relative interesting conversation about will AI take over the world, et cetera. Now, literary magazines, journals with open access um, submissions are all closing down their submission processes because not just can they tell the difference between AI generated content and not, but they're receiving such a massive influx of generated content that they can't, don't have the time, the effort or the ability to wade through it. So they're stopping and saying, wait, we gotta think about this. We're seeing this in images as well, because the, you know, we talk about this in terms of text, but we know that these systems are scraping images. Once again, under copyright, under protection, under license, people trying to sell their, their wares, et cetera, they're bringing them in and they're training AI systems to generate content. And we're seeing things like art competitions and all these other stuff are now having to deal with this massive influx of different content. I'm not gonna say inferior quality, I'm gonna say different because we know that there's no inherent good and bad in information, it's all contextual. So we're seeing this happen in this world and the publishers are freaking out. Um, they're freaking out and they're, trying to negotiate ways of using this text and they're being driven to the idea of taking it to court. And part of the problem that gets really complicated is copyright. And this isn't just a US copyright issue because US copyright is of a, a certain flavor that is being pushed internationally through things like the um, World Intellectual Protection Organization and through treaties and such. And that is the idea that human agency needs to be involved in works that come under copyright. So you can't, for example, go in and all these images that I generated through AI systems, you can't copyright them because a human didn't do it. Now, the argument is, does that mean that this is a unique creation, in which case copyright law says humans can't do it? Or is this a derivative work, in which case copyright very much sits with the author? And that's one of the arguments that's going on right now. The other one will be, transformative, that idea that, that these works on their own 
have their copyright, but when you bring them together and aggregate them and run them through algorithms and generate AI systems, that is a transformed work that may be inspired by, but not directly connected to the original copyright work. By the way, I'm not a lawyer, so please consult your own. We also know that, and what I'm really excited about, the back to the Boone side of this, is that a content, AI content is going to be not just coming into libraries, but going out of libraries that one of the things I find extraordinarily interesting and exciting is using these tools to generate and tell stories that often don't get told. Where libraries and librarians can be working with the members of their communities, marginalized communities, all members of their communities to begin to tell their stories in their voice. And if they have issues with writing, then they can begin to prompt and use AI to generate scripts. And that script can quickly turn into a narrative in their own voice without them having to record it. And then that can turn into images and that can turn into movies. I was just, um, Emily Clasper was posting on Facebook about, um, she went to a workshop about using AI to generate your own comic book where you are your own hero. That idea of being able to generate this content and then tell that authentic story. People can say, yeah, 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 but it's gonna be AI generated. Karen Gavigan and a group at University of South Carolina about six to seven years ago, had a fabulous project where they went in and worked with incarcerated youth, so at the high school, prison high schools. And one of the things they did is the those, those students, those incarcerated students, wrote a book, AIDS in the End Zone. They wrote a book about the dangers of AIDS, and they didn't ever write before. So they didn't, so they worked with writers to help them do it. And then none of them had illustration skills. So they were teamed with illustrators from our, our art department in South Carolina, and they did this beautiful book. And so did they draw it? No. Did they write every word? No. But did they author that piece? Yes. So the idea of once again, being able to come in and tell your story in a way that is much more polished, that you have control over, that you can see, and in partnership with these tools, as opposed to um, where these tools are driving it. And there are real questions about that. I get it. I don't want to forget that. So this is to me and the opportunity, which is I think we're in a situation where librarians can really lead the way about AI adoption, particularly within communities and how communities have impact. Um, for example, I'm having a conversation right now with several state libraries where we're talking about what's the role of AI in state library work. And so um, the old joke is once you know one state library, you know one state library. So it's going to be different in each state, but all of them have an interesting connection, right? A lot of them either are have their own archives or collections of materials that they could use to train AI systems. Um, many of them have functions around government documents and keeping uh, government documents, analyzing those government documents, looking for trends, looking for inconsistencies. How do we look at this material? That's a role they can play in developing training and creating ways of taking one person rural librarians and suddenly giving them a marketing department that they didn't have before. How can we begin to expand the capabilities of libraries and how can librarians be part of making this happen? So a couple of ideas. One, context is king. Librarians understand that information in context matters, right? Credibility, quality, utility, all of these features that we are not inherent in the information that are brought to it by a given context, right? And so we can begin to talk about when it's appropriate to use AI-generated content, when it's not appropriate to use AI-generated content. I was having a, a great conversation with school librarians. And one of the issues university professors are dealing with as well, but that school librarians are dealing with is Teachers are also looking at AI and AI generation and are be a bit frozen. What do we do about it? We've already seen many, we've seen several school districts that have simply forbidden its use, either explicitly in policy or by changing their filters to, to prevent access to these systems. Some of those, by the way, have pulled back from those because they're realizing some of the change. And school librarians, one of their primary values and functions is working with teachers to try and come up with critical thinking skills in their assignments. Um, and the old, old sort of negative story was that teachers would be teaching about Abraham Lincoln. It would be President's Week. They would take their students, drop them into the office and say, go write a report about President Lincoln. And here's the encyclopedia L, right? And that was a bad assignment. 
because it didn't take critical thinking skills. It didn't take anything. And so school librarians would work with them. Well, maybe we could do this and we could add this and they could search this kind of stuff. And we have these databases and et cetera. And now we're finding the same thing where librarians are, or where teachers are going, well, how do I prevent people from plagiarizing and working on this? Well, let's talk about how you can do critical thinking skills that incorporate automatically generated texts. And are there personal stories that people can tell that aren't in those systems, et cetera? So we're beginning to see this idea of providing guidance to um, instructional staff in schools. We're seeing it in colleges where university professors are trying to figure out how we now have new assignments um, that make sense in this AI generated world. Do we adopt it? Do we not adopt it? How do we use it? There was one service called Turnitin. Turnitin is a plagiarism detection system. It's the sort of AI cop. And the way it works is it looks at the, not only does it look across the web, but it looks at all the previously submitted papers from all of their clients across the country, across the world. And it will tell you, oh, this appeared in this journal, this appeared in a previous paper, et cetera, and give you sort of a score about potential plagiarism. Well, they announced last school year, last academic year, that they had developed an AI um, detection tool. So now not only could you tell who you were plagiarizing, you could catch them at using AI tools. They withdrew it about a month ago because they found out it doesn't work. They couldn't, they couldn't detect it. They couldn't determine it. In fact, in some ways, we know as we do teacher, they said the problem is that it writes too well. Some of my students, I look at this and I go, this is too well constructed. I'm teaching you how to write. You don't know yet. So this is not right. Let's talk about this. So we have this idea of now how we can work with publishers to the uh, moving away from the idea of gatekeeping. We are the ones who pick the quality. We are the ones who share information to the role of publisher of the community. We can talk about different quality and how we bring that in. And so we can begin leading the way in terms of how publishing and the dissemination of scholarly and well-formatted texts are brought together and how we can work within that system. We know that there's power in diversity. Librarians understand that this knowledge infrastructure I mentioned before is in constant flux and churn, right? We can use the span of librarianship. We have librarians across borders, physical borders, but we also have across types, academic, public schools, across community segments. We can be looking at what are the potential impacts and values of AI, not just in terms of bottom line for a publisher or bottom line for meta, but in terms of community impact. And if we talk to each other across those boundaries, we can say, well, this is what's happening in K-12, and this is what's happening in higher ed, and this is what's happening in special libraries, and having an ongoing dialogue that breaks down our traditional barriers, we can begin to see effects of these tools much earlier than many other people who may be looking in a really small, small narrow slice. So that becomes something important. The other reason I think that librarians are really important, and this is our time, is that we're an agile community, right? This is the idea that librarianship um, has shown persistence of focus and agility through dramatic existential change. And you're going to look at me and you're going, which library have you been in? But the truth is, you know, we have a 4,000 year history and things have changed in that. You mentioned, Don mentioned the pandemic and we mentioned um, war, we mentioned, I mean, libraries have lived through those things and survived in those things. And we will survive, by the way, in terms of these book banning and discussions. And in fact, one of the interesting things I'm really interested in is using AI to change a narrative. The narrative that's going on in school and public libraries right now is around the idea of challenges in book banning. Who has the right? Don, once again, in his introduction said, you know, libraries are really interesting um, Swiss army knife organizations where they can build to reflect their community. And the question becomes, what happens when the community wants to build something that the librarians don't? What happens when they want to build a strongly curated collection? What if happens when public library, communities want public libraries to become ideologically oriented, right? One of the, um, what we're seeing with some of these First Amendment rights is the attempt to put a view, primarily a conservative religious view, um, on collection development. And part of the short-sightedness is, okay, let's say you win that battle. When that worldview changes and the next group comes into line, which I think was a Who song about the next revolution, um, then are we going to just see libraries battle back and forth and be the next pogrom on different contexts and topics? But librarians have increasingly defined themselves not serving a community, but being part of a community. 
and therefore having voice and agency within that community to fight for diverse views and wide views. Anyway, what I like about AI is we are in, once again, let me make my semi-controversial statement here. The parental rights argument in librarianship, particularly around book banning, is not a narrative we can win because we are we need to require on things like nuance and fidelity of argument and logic. And they're relying on emotions and parents protecting children. That's a strong narrative. And frankly, we believe that parents should protect children. That's why we come up with things like, you are in control of your child's learning. Well, that's a nuance that will get lost very quickly with, yeah, but when my kid is in your library and they find page 38, right? Whatever it is on page 38, forget that the whole book is about an, an understanding and generative system about you know, an author creating empathy, but on page 38, there's a nasty picture, right? That's a hard argument to win. So rather than going right in and arguing that, we need to demonstrate that, look, we do more than books and materials and you trust us and we have positive impacts in this global sense, trust us in this one. And so the idea of talking about AI and workforce development, whether that's in a university setting or a public setting, even in a school setting for those who may go directly into work after, after secondary school, I think is a real powerful argument because it's hard to say those pedophile grooming liberal librarians over there do a really fantastic job of preparing the workforce of the future, right? Those logic doesn't fit together. And so by demonstrating that we can talk about, yeah, but those librarians over there prepare you to think broadly in a diverse world and prepare you for workforce. And then by the way, we prepare you for being part of a liberal democracy. We prepare you for governing yourself. That's the argument that we win. And so this agility of our ability to come up with new arguments, to come up with new narratives, to talk about the greatest stories that have ever been told and releasing those stories, I think are important. But once again, I feel your pain, right? The idea that over the past 40 years, we've seen desktop computing come in. So computers move from big buildings and business processes to things that we could keep our um, recipes on and we could do spreadsheets for our personal budgets and we could play games on, right? That was a massive shift that came through communities. And as librarians, we had to go through it to the point of talking about um, you know, the Gates Foundation back in its heyday in library land, where it was creating public access terminals and public access computing, that was a big shift where libraries became not just places to get physical materials, but to come in and get computing and work in computing. And we had to work through that. Digitization, mass digitization from the Google Books project where trucks were hauling away books off of Harvard Yards. It could be um, digitized to the digitization of born digital, that our flow of knowledge and sources and materials and the knowledge infrastructure have become increasingly and overwhelmingly digital. And libraries, yes, we had our existential crisis, but now we we changed. One of the things that people don't necessarily realize, back to this chimera issue, is that if you look at the collection development in libraries, you look at the concept of the collection in libraries, it has had the most dramatic change over the past 50 years than any other part of librarianship. I'm, and I'm including things like, you know, online catalogs. I'm including the web and social media. I'm including eBooks. I'm including reference changing and community engagement and all of that. The collection is the thing that's changed the most. It's moved from the things we own to the things we license and access. It's moved from things that we know to things that are full of stuff that we don't. And we have still been able to create a relatively coherent concept of collection, even though we're talking about a diverse set of resources, open access fits into that, et cetera. So we've lived through that. The telecommunications revolutions that took, you know, phones and telecommunications from a box with a wire on a wall to a supercomputer sitting in our pockets, right? We've lived through this. The internet explosion, the web explosion, not only are we seeing massive scale changes, but we're seeing them come more rapidly. And that's tiring. I mean, you can be a Swiss army knife, but eventually you get really tired of having to pull that thing out and find another attachment, nicking your thumb on the fork attachment, et cetera, right? That's a lot. 
And to say that we're agile and ready to take on the next one, I know is a lot, but we absolutely can do that. We absolutely can, instead of worrying about it, be leading in it. Take a look at this and how we can move forward with it. How can we become more instrumental? One of the opportunities that we saw during the pandemic was digital divide, access to broadband, et cetera, became an issue not just that libraries were fighting about and education was fighting about, but that Fortune 500 companies were finding out. Suddenly the C-suite went home and realized that they had gotten away from everything in their rural, in their rural palaces, but they didn't have good internet connection to continue to work. Workers were going home and didn't, and, you know, blowing through their data caps within the first Zoom meeting they had. So we suddenly had common purpose. We're seeing the same thing, common purpose where librarians can be repositories of information for training, they can be access communities, they can be preparing communities, they can be using and telling the storytelling, and they can be part of creating an ethical approach to this. So here's my, my sort of remember, my, my, my action plan, if you will. Nothing will change without structural change. Um, once again, a, a story. I was giving some workshops um, around tech logic and they produce automated materials, hand like put the book on the, the conveyor belt and scanners and such, put it in the right spot. And um, one of the, the people I was speaking with said, how long does it take you to do book sorting in the morning? You know, let's say if it took you three hours when you're physically pulling out, how long will it take if you're using the automated system? And her answer was three hours which is if you don't change the processes, the evaluations, people's thinking, if you don't change the culture, then you're not gonna get change out of it. And so we have, for example, intellectual property and entrenched stakeholder interests. The publishing system is not suing OpenAI and such so that they can change, they're suing so they don't have to, right? We see this all the time. We see the notion like eBooks, eBooks are, Boring. He books were supposed to be the next evolution of the book. It was supposed to take us from what Gutenberg had figured out a couple of hundred years ago to the next thing. And instead, what it became was a long line of text wrapped around electronic pages. Where is our multimedia interactivity, hypertext going crazy? Where is new ways of telling stories? Right? We see that a lot of that is because of the entrenched rights about people telling narrative and straight storytelling and people not wanting to lose money off of things waited on ebooks until they could put them in a model. So now instead of buying physical items, we buy digital items, but they're the same thing. We've saved the business, we've saved the publisher's money. And we haven't saved us a cent because of this invention. Right? We need to change the lone genius copyright narrative. That I, the book I write today is under copyright until I die. And plus 90 years is insane. We also see this in things like transformation um you know and we we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of hip-hop hip-hop was born off of remixing culture it was born off the idea which was frankly where we got copyright originally 300 years ago which was to take bits and pieces fair use not the whole thing and recombine it add to it and create this transformative work that was a new art form but we've seen that copyright holders have run back in that intellectual property holders are back in. And now the only people who are allowed to remix work with large existing catalogs from signed labels, that the individual doing it in their backyard can't do it anymore because of threats of copyright. The other thing we have to be also really aware of is that AI is different. AI is different from the web and different from the internet and different from a lot of these previous examples, all of the previous examples, because AI takes a lot of resources. So unlike the web, AI requires 185,000 gallons of water to train one of these massive infrastructure concentrators. To create ChatGPT 4 and 5 takes gallons and I, I forget, I think it's metric hectares or something of water just to cool the machines that are doing the searches. And that means that you need machines that can generate a city's worth of heat in order to run these things. We know right now that the current implementation of AI systems, once again, generative AI, et cetera, are built on 10 billion nodes. So it has to sort of look at 10 billion different nodes to figure out how to respond to, and this is your term paper, and this is your paragraph. And there's no way to sort of yet 
trim those down to just the parts you need. What we saw with um, web search is that web search started by capturing the whole web and building these massive index. And what we've seen of the evolution over 20, 30 years is they were able to make searching really fast and efficient and low power. We have not had that same change in AI. Now, what that means is not only is there an environmental impact that as librarians, we need to worry about sustainability and inform our communities. It also means that large players, Meta, Apple, Google, in China, state actors, can build these systems and experiment with these systems, but Dave in his office can't, right? Someone just can't download it and try it. With the web, I know, I built one of the first 100 websites. It was, hey, Mark, Mark Andreessen, how did I get in this compiling error? What can I try? Okay, let me put this up on my laptop. Let me put this up on whatever. Anyone could try it and do it. You could do anything with the web. It can fit on a phone. It can fit in a fridge. But AI is not like that. You can generate these lovely pictures, but you can't generate the system that generates these lovely pictures. That takes a massive infrastructure. And so we're already seeing policy move to the idea of creating licensing and control of the industry to prevent Skynet. But that also means it's going to hope that it's going to probably invest power in the existing players and not let new players in. Right. So that's new. We need to be fighting for ethical, explainable, and regulated AI. So um, some of this image, this image for here, here was produced by Bing's Image Generator. It's built on ChatGPT's DALI, OpenAI's DALI. That grabbed every image you could find off the internet, regardless of who owned it and who wanted it and who could use it. If you generate some of the others using Adobe Firefly, those images are generated off of the massive stock collection they have licensed and paid for ahead of time. We see Getty, one of the largest image repositories and stock art collections is building their own AI and they're looking to do it in an ethical way. Where are we in preparing our communities and working with our communities, our scholars, working with our local authors, et cetera, to be part of that? And we need to talk about good regulation for AI good regulation that deals with copyright, that deals with the idea of preserving labor, but at the same time also does not just simply reinforce existing power structures. And ultimately, we need to talk about becoming the publisher of the community, moving from AI to IA, intelligence simplification. When that person comes in and wants to tell their story, when someone comes in and wants to make their movie, when someone comes in and wants to make a beautiful version of the 60th anniversary for their mother and father, or if they come in and they want to tell a new story they have, we need to be there to help them tell that story and in such a way that they control that narrative and aren't being controlled by the devices they're using. Ultimately, the future of all of this and the way forward comes down to community. How do we knit together our diverse communities, both those that we serve and ourselves, how do we still seek power for the marginalized so these things can be advantaging those without power as opposed to continually and furthering lack of power within it, seeking justice for all, and building a movement where we look for ethical AI to improve our communities, not looking for AI that robs our planet of resources and gives more money to those already vested in the system. So there was a lot of me just talking at you. Here's how I used to create these images. And by the way, if you don't know, AI generated images, according to the uh, US um, Copyright Office and upheld in some initial reports, these are not under copyright because an, a, a, only humans can generate material that can be copyrighted. And so um, that's interesting in and of itself. All right, I've rambled on too long. I'm gonna put this down and see if we have Comments, questions, what did I get right? What did I get wrong? What the hell? Uh, amazing, uh, David. It's everything you mentioned seemed to me to have entire branches of conversations that went off in multiple directions. Uh, I appreciated the already pervasive existence of this uh, algorithmic controlled world that we live in for some time now. And Maybe that helps us familiarize ourselves with what is coming if we just kind of look back a little bit and see some of these examples. Um, <clears throat> I think your your focus on the ability of these tools to do routine tasks for 
Well, anybody for, you know, a person wanting to tell their story or this is extremely common in, in coding and programming. All the programmers are using this to, you know, do uh, routine uh, tasks. Uh, the it re Speaking of pervasive already, uh, I was involved in a venture in, uh, in China from the mid 90s for 10 years. And we created a, a, a product, a software product called Digibook that was licensed to libraries that would allow people to come into the library with their documents, their photos and whatever, digitize those, put them into a kind of a, uh, an album format, and then the library would index it and include it in its collection, right. permanent collection. So uh, we referred to it as the uh, the book of China with a billion chapters. Wow. And that resonated with me when you were talking about this, this kind of capability. Uh, I think there's a lot of creative talent out there that runs up against these barriers of production and, you know, how do, how do I do all these different things? So that's fantastic. Um, it, <laughs> it's one aspect. It's one seemingly small aspect of, of this, this huge array of, of issues on copyright. So you're saying, okay, an AI cannot generate copyrightable material. Mm -hmm. So how much personhood, person authoring constitutes a person's authorship? You know, if I change one paragraph of a book, is that my book or is it an AI book? How would you, how would you deal with that yeah. part? I'm going to share. I'm going to share a slightly embarrassing screen of mine, but um, which which demonstrates what a narcissist I am. But that's not why I'm sharing it. <laughs> this is a this is a site called Night Cafe, and you can do a lot for free, or you can pay into it. And one of the things, the reason I use this Night Cafe is, as you'll see, suddenly Dave everywhere, um, and I use it to generate other images. But the reason I'm playing around with this, <clears throat> pardon me, is this is one of the few systems that allows you to train it, so you can upload up to like 50, 100 pictures of yourself or whomever, by the way, whomever you would like. And you create a model. And then you say, okay, let do me and Van Gogh. Now, we're not perfect. I have my third arm. That's exciting, right? Um, uh, here's here's lovely images. I post, posted these to Facebook. I, my mother-in-law called and said, Dave lost a lot of weight. And I said, I wish that were true. Um, but it only wanted my face, not my body. Um, this kind of thing. I was an illustration major as an undergraduate. I grew up wanting to be an illustrator. I could never paint this kind of photorealistic image. I could never generate it. But now I can quickly go in and create some interesting examples, et cetera. And obviously, other things that I have done before um, and trying to bring in different diversity and such to it. So, but technically, None of these can be put under copyright. I can't copyright them. I can't control their distribution. Well, I can through their site, but I can't once it gets out. I trained it. I built it. I trained it on stuff I took. So technically under copyright material, I own the images I uploaded. Um, and so this is interesting, right? How do we begin to share this information? How do we begin to distribute this information back and forth? And so copyright isn't just a matter of the final product. As you point out, it's the whole level up to that product. And this is what OpenAI, they just made a move to dismiss the court case, the publisher court case based on fair use. What they said was, we're generating things that can't be put under copyright. So therefore, this is a moot issue, right? It's like, we're not taking copyrighted material to create copyright material. To copyrighted material to make non-copyrighted material, therefore under fair use, fair game. We'll see what the courts think. Um, the, the, one of the most important pieces of legislation over the past 30 years was actually a Nevada case against Google, where publishers went on and said, Google is violating our copyright, they're indexing our site, they're generating these little things, they're building their business based on our copyrighted work. And um, the court case found for Google but not under what we wanted them to. They found under Google because Google allowed an opt out. So you could opt out of the system. Now, OpenAI is not doing that. Um, but there was also this sense of transformative work. Later, court case and regulation said things like search engines and building indexes is not considered a derivative work. It's a sort of new thing. So we're, we're waiting for that piece of legislation that happened in the US. EU is not waiting. EU is already built, 
beginning to build regulation and policy, not just around the copyright side, but ethical use and fair use disclosure information. Places like Adobe are trying to create watermarks and so that you can identify this material moving forward. So there's just, we're in a massive bit of flux. This, once again, 11 months. And a lot of the structure we have around intellectual property, uh, a lot of the structure we have around copyright doesn't move in 11 month segments, it moves in years. And so right now we're in a bit of a wild, wild west, but that doesn't mean that we can't take as librarians the opportunity right now to begin to think about what we want it to look like and then to begin to help move it. I mentioned before that I'm working with, um, looking to work with state libraries on AI um, and what did, what's the state library's role in AI? Well, one of it may be, what kind of policies do we set about legislation and policy? What goes before, you know, what goes before the legislature? Is can it be AI generated? What are the ethical concerns around it? How are we going to structure this material? What kinds of policies can we set? And there isn't another industry, except for maybe a few lawyers, that spend their day in, day out with pragmatic intellectual property than librarians. We deal with this every single day. And we have a couple of hundred years in US copyright working on this issue. We need to be active. And right now, the narrative around book banning and intellectual freedom is taking a lot of attention from the idea of intellectual freedom from this AI generated information and potential winner conversation. That was a ramble. I don't don't know if I had. Oh, that was that was, good. that was good. Uh, <laughs> you know, copyright is kind of a little corner of this this whole thing. Misinformation is a huge issue. Uh, the trust asset of libraries seems to be a major asset. How can that apply to that? How can people turn to librarians to curate this? flood of new AI generated content. Well, and this is another opportunity, right? The opportunities right now through book banning, through AI, through sort of national conversations, we've actually generated the skepticism that we wanted in the, in the general public for a long time, right? We now have people stopping and worrying about misinformation and disinformation in a different way. Now their behavior is still crap. Their behavior is still spread it. I agree with it, share it. But we at least now have conversations. And when you look at what some states is will, are willing to pass around um, authenticity of information and content and protection and how do we define content, which is, well, I won't get too far into it. We at least have a de debate and a dialogue. And librarians are in the middle of that debate and dialogue. And so once again, how do we do our little judo move to move from the idea of libraries are are places where smut and horrible things are being disseminated to libraries are places where there's a conversation about what should be disseminated, how should you get it in communities. And unless we get in front of that dialogue, what it will turn into is ideology pushing what libraries should be as opposed to librarians taking this as an opportunity to reintroduce the kind of work they've been doing around information literacy for a very long time. And more importantly, build it into legislation. I was just in Illinois. Illinois passed a law that said thou shalt not ban books and state law. And I said, this is a fantastic opportunity to go back and talk to the same legislatures and say, that's great. Step one. Step two is the, every school needs a school librarian to tell them why you don't ban the books, to talk about intellectual freedom and access. Right? We, the idea of how do we use this as a momentum? Same thing with AI. AI, I mean, many different ways. But this is a chance for us to renegotiate our concept with publishers. Right, because publishing is like, look, there's a way forward. Librarians used to be the gatekeepers and the, the people who knew the information and knew right and wrong and basically reify the majority view of the world. We changed and we're doing better because of it. Let's talk about how that could happen in, in publishing, do. for example. Yeah. Let's do. Um uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna call on Stephen Abram here in a second, uh, but I wanted to uh highlight uh, Linda's question about uh, guidelines for labor, labeling authorship. Is there something simple that can be done or is it we have to have a whole uh, conference to make each determination? <laughs> the answer is there's not one that I know of. Stephen may actually. Um, but the one, I mean, every organization seems to be developing their own. Our university has, of course, the lovely committee dealing with it. Um, Adobe is working on the image side to try and build an industry example for this labeling. Um, 
EU is working on regulations to put it together, but um, I'm not aware of sort of one global. Right now it's happening in, in bits and pockets uh, on how to do it. Like even, even within Texas, while we're working at a university level, I have to come up with it within my class, which I say is go for it, use it, just tell me you're using it. Um, Cause I'm kind of curious of how they do it. So I don't know of one in, Stephen, do you know of any one around uh, there? The, uh, the invention that's happening right now is happening in the disability accessibility space. So they're using AI to label pictures and label content. And that's, it's, I always take a look at toys and uh, uh, disability spaces and bridging uh, ability. And so that's very interesting. And of course it's counterintuitive that AI is doing the labeling, the cataloging, the tagging, and it's incredibly accurate. And so, yes, there are things like you've got your third arm or when you said you were Dr. Lankies, it gave you a stethoscope. Uh, it's <laughs> it's fascinating. Uh, Don yeah, yeah. Pre predicted I was going to ask a question. So mine is around uh, a debate we, we've been having all through Internet Librarian this week. And it's... Uh, and unfortunately, it's become polarized. Uh, those who want regulation, those who don't. And I think uh, we need to move out of our comfort space. So even in your talk, even in the stuff I'm hearing from everybody, everybody goes to the content space, copyright, all those things where we are comfortable. And we aren't understanding what generalized intelligence is. Mm -hmm. It is generalized intelligence. And it's based on the written word and the artifact, whether it's a picture or whatever. It is not human. And so we do not have em generalized emotional intelligence in the space yet. We have performative. Chat GPT is incredibly polite. So it's performative, but it's not real. And so we need to spend more time understanding because what librarians core skill is, is our empathy, our emotional intelligence, our compassion. And that's what makes us great. And so when we start, when you use the regulate word regulation, I know you're using it in a very generic sense mm -hmm. because you like conversations, you know, we're at the uh, life is a conversation stage in this stuff. And so how do we, and I'll get to my question, how do we understand the right framework to, like, you know, in the early days of the internet, we had don't tax the internet. We had right. uh, don't regulate it too soon. We had let it evolve so we understand what it is. That's exactly where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm more in favor of a middling response. I think there's an end game where I want uh, chat GPT and large language models and everything put in jail when they reach sentience which they will. And when they reach sentience, we need to understand that they need to be jailed until we put guardrails and regulations and laws in place. But we need to allow them to evolve to that. And then we need to look at what are the guardrails now? What's the end game? When do we trigger this stuff? And so I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on that idea, emotional intelligence um, and the idea of... Uh, what are the right, um, I think guidelines are too weak, but I think mm -hmm. legal guardrails aren't. I, I think legal guardrails are are vital, but it's, and that, you're right, I've been talking about copyright and electoral property and it's, it's broader than that. Um, for example, I mentioned before how the, the technology is a huge resource, right? It takes huge resources to build these things at scale. And that well, eliminates- <laughs> right. It's definitely not green and it's definitely not um, democratic, as opposed to, say, the web, which was very democratic. It came out of university spaces and anyone could adapt it. Anyone could use it. And in fact, the argument we're having around things like social media and the web are sort of who's allowed in as opposed to um, who who's kept out. And I think that's one of the major differences that's going on with the AI discussion is that we have large players with embedded infrastructure that can take advantage of this. And so there is a sort of not just a fairness competition angle to this, but just the diversity angle of having multiple people look at it. For example, universities are part of our job 
is to figure out how to do this more cheaply and more efficiently. So to turn it a little bit green, right? This is where you talk about sparse models. And there's lots of fun stuff we talk about with that. Um, and so we need to continue to develop it, right? And I, I like your the idea of a sort of trigger at the end as opposed to stopping at the beginning, which is when we run into things that go too far, we need a mechanism to define what too far is. Um, and a lot of that is, I think at this point, what what applications can be applied. We've seen, for example, in the legal setting where lawyers, and there's you know, fabulous two and three stories that we all hold up as, as, as case studies where a lawyer has used chat GPT to generate their, their brief and they put in you know, citations to things that didn't happen and they've been caught and that's horrible, but law is gonna have to deal with the idea of how does this incorporate and use it. We see this with policy. Right. One of the things that we see in terms of policy that libraries are really concerned about, and I'm not talking necessarily here about book banning, but I am talking about things like liability and obscenity laws, is now when someone has a really good piece of legislation they want to use to put librarians in jail because they gave away gender queer, read Arkansas, read potentially Texas, I can now take that right one and say, now write this for every country, now write this. And, and the other thing we write this for every state, but what we're seeing is that legislation is having at the hyper-local level. They're trying to get local laws passed and then sort of build up. Write this for Gerald, write this for Taylor, write this for et cetera. And so we're gonna have to have the conversation about AI in that field and whether it can do it and whether we want to do it. Because my definition of policy is that policy is the difference between what you can do and what you will allow to happen, right? We can do lots of things, but policy and law sets whether we can or can't. And so we're not quite sure, back to your point, in terms of a middling example, we're not quite sure how far this goes. And so we're, let's let it play out for a bit. The other, see, the other thing though is transparency. Um, one thing that we can talk about right now with those guardrails um, is the transparency of them. Who's setting those policies? What are they filtering from? We know, we know. Bing and BARD and OpenAI, et cetera, have built in non-generative rules about thou shalt not say racist things, thou shalt not do these things, thou shalt not talk about murder, thou shalt what um, what are those? Who did they develop? Yeah. Should there be other ones? How can we have a and, conversation? And, and, about and can that? it be global? Like, can it be global? Like right. the United States protects hate speech and the right. rest of the world doesn't. And right. so how do we build a global construct on that? We learn from copyright that the dominance of the publishing industry by US-based companies uh, influences copyright law globally and usage. And so it's fascinating that we need a global response to this. We learn that through WIPO and everything else. And then how do we move forward? And so we, you be... know, the leading, the leading case that's so interesting is the uh, bonobo chimpanzee case when they tried, to, when a zoo tried to copyright uh, a chimpanzee's work. Now, chimpanzees are obviously sentient. Right. And, but they didn't allow it to be copyrighted. Yeah, so, I think the, the, the one concern I have about global is we, I think sometimes we overestimate global in the sense of when you talk about internet and the idea that the original idea with the internet was to set it free and it was going to set it across this democratic, democratic, democratic wave of people participation and is going to fight authoritarianism and what we found is the exact same technology we put in the hands of other world leaders is used to control that area and control that demographic and so we have to be i don't want to say just if we make it global it magically gets better um but we do need i do agree that we need to work beyond our very local borders whether that's town state nation um hemisphere etc yes it's uh <laughs> This, this very idea that everybody had at that time and when the web exploded in the mid 90s was this democratization that, uh, uh, you know, the individual power of, of authorship and creation and that it couldn't be controlled. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it can be. <laughs> so yeah. that's both the lesson for helping us and for uh, injuring us, uh, depending on who has that control. I think it's going to be a difficult challenge to hit a trigger point we recognize some kind of a threat from sentient AI, which itself hasn't already anticipated that and freaked <laughs> the lock on the prison that we're going to try to. <laughs> I wouldn't bet on that one. 
Um, yeah, I have, but, a, I have a colleague who, who who wrote a nice long, very smart colleague, wrote a nice long piece about we're, we're, we forget agency here. We're all getting worried about it taking over the world and all this other stuff, but it really is not a problem. We just don't allow it to do it. And I thought that's exactly how computer viruses came about, right? It's like, it, no one no one planned to have viruses invade our computers and steal our data. They did it because we set the no question. We just didn't know how clever they were. And, and we've already seen AI generate code when it didn't know it was supposed to be able to generate code and things like that. And so, you know, I'm not, I'm not a doomsday person on this. I don't think we're to the point of a generalized intelligence and, and it, the, the singularity, et cetera. I think we are certainly at the point where, back to that Chimera thing, we can talk about now about the utilization of AI and weapon systems because it's in AI and weapon systems. The idea that these missiles can fly for four miles, they don't just go on a big long arc. They use data and connections and responses and same thing with, right? So maybe that's a good place to start. The idea of personal health information. I have my lovely watch. This is back to that idea. You didn't know you were using AI, right? The, when I'm walking, it goes, oh, you're going to walk. That comes from machine learning. AI, Apple sort of refuses to use the word AI because it's trendy, but they use sort of advanced machine learning, same damn thing, right? And that is great for me, but it's also great for an insurer to find out is he working and therefore his deductible, right? So all these anticipated flow throughs are still there, but I, I, it is the web in the sense that I think it's going to have the same impact. And I, I'm liking the fact that librarians are more engaged in this topic than with the web, which they were much more respond, reactive to. Um, and I think, um, Stephen, to your point about getting out of our comfort zone, I agree. We need to get out of our comfort zone. But really, because one of the questions was our relationship to our communities. AI does not change the relationship with the communities because your relationship should have already changed to the community. Right. The idea that that um, we aren't just training the people we serve, it is we are preparing ourselves, we, the community of librarians uh, together, doing part of that. And so it's a and way of reintroducing be, ourselves. And we continue to be rooted in text. And yet AI is playing out differently. Like, I'm glad you showed the pictures and all, we can all see the misinformation, disinformation consequences of video and the current uh, Hollywood strikes. But then we look at opportunities like the release of the earbuds that translate any language right. or the plugin you can put on your browser to read any language. Suddenly, in, in your native language, like I can see it in Chinese or Korean or whatever I set my default to, and that changes the nature of our access to the real world of knowledge and not the English dominated world of knowledge. Yeah, and my, my that's, son. That's core to our business. Yeah, my son, who I have to put in a pitch briefly, just finished his master's in foreign affairs and his, his thesis topic was corrosive AI. And it was not just that AI could be used to diminish um, trust in democratic institutions, but that it could happen very, very rapidly. Um, that that right. We already have the tools to do the I mean, already being used in ads and political ads and such to undermine the credibility that we, the little bit of credibility that we still cling to around our government. It's already office. happened, as you said. Yeah. <laughs> this is the point. This is a point. I think uh, as soon as we predict something, we find that it has already happened, and that's how we got the idea. <laughs> we intuited something that had already been happening, and. Uh, you know, the, the the horse is out of the barn on so many of these things. It, it, it's moving so quickly. Uh, you mentioned that Amazon has a three book a day limit. I mean, that's just arbitrary. And even mm -hmm. that is just a phenomenal cascade of content, which in turn then feeds the base of information off of which the AIs are learning. Yeah. So is that not a, a degrading process of, of feeding? It, it is. You had mentioned in our last, in our last get together, you had mentioned the idea that AI is now generating text to train AI on. And some, and that had initial promise. But once again, everything's happening at warp speed. What the, the report that I mentioned was that actually it's not very effective. It leads to a degrade. Um, and that's why the human curated, human high effort, human research, human edited, human written blocks of text, books 
articles, reporting are so essential. Um, and um, Linda, I see your comment about how we shouldn't um, allow technology to subvert the human factor. And that's why I think one of the interesting things going on now is the actors strike in the US um, about creating AI um, basically doubles. The, you know, the, the original thing was you show up and you're a background actor, you show up and get paid for one day. That one day is you walking into a scanning booth and for the rest of the eons, they can throw you in the background of anything they want, right? That's a labor action, but it's set, seeking to set policy. Right now, it's setting policy through contracts in that, that domain, but that's going to be an interesting question, which is where, you know, it's not that technology can't do this, it's that we don't let it do this, or we don't benefit, we don't provide large economic benefit to these kinds of things. And once again, just about everything we do in life has the same equation, right? Gun makers. Yeah. Uh, well, I certainly, yeah. I'm certainly thrilled uh, the AI apps that uh, govern what you post on Facebook. And I'm going, okay, you're demonizing my voice because you don't understand irony and satire. So when I <laughs> post a link saying of Abraham Lincoln uh, commenting on how bad the internet is, you do not block my picture and block me because Abraham Lincoln never said that. It's irony it's satire and there's a whole level of emotional intelligence that are part of our humanity i would never go out on a limb and say that ai can't eventually learn to do irony but right. could it ever create a barbie movie and and comment backwards and forwards on male and female empowerment roles like that was true uh ideological commentary that I'm not sure, and that's a human invention with a human director and human writers. And, and I'm not sure that that could yeah. have been created by AI. I think that's an interesting history. question. I, what, what I'm more interested in is in the next 12 months, um, which is the idea that I want librarians involved in the conversations about impacts within our community, right? So we can have the debates and discussions about generative AI and the idea that they may create a movie that no human could have created that has its own blah, blah, blah. Um, and I think those are great discussions. One of the things that we are faced with at AI, once again, 11 months for generative AI. I mean, it's been around for a long time, but 11 months in terms of public consciousness around it, is this is an actionable conversation. This is a conversation that's happening right now. I, I, I had a dinner, I was having dinner with my wife and my son and my mother, and my, my son was working on his, his thesis. So we were talking about AI, blah, 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 my wife, whom I love, just suddenly said, okay, I hear all this crap. I'm a travel agent, how does this help me? And totally switched the conversation. It's like, well, watch this. And I brought chat to you. He said, why you should go on a lovely Greek vacation, social media post with tags. And there it was. And she goes, all right, that just saved me eight hours a week because I can have them generate those things, right? And that's okay, right? That's not talking about social commentary. That's talking about specific actions today. And then the question becomes as librarians, one, can we help? Well, we have the same problem. How can I talk about our new book talk? And how can I talk about the new um, you know, activity coming up? And how can you create an image about, um, and I don't have to worry about copyright. Um, that's happening, that can happen right now. And, we, and one of the things, like I said, you, so some of the ideas we were pitching around the state library thing was, um, you know, imagine just about every major city now has a, uh, an a AI action where they want to sort of look at it and they want to talk about industry about every industry is finding an AI angle, et cetera. And librarians, starting with state libraries, but public libraries, lots of urban libraries, academic libraries, can be part of that conversation. So we can imagine a Texas-wide initiative, workforce initiative, where we want to minimize the losses, the $86 million predicted loss, job losses, and we want to maximize the 96 million potentially new roles. They don't use jobs. This is a World Economic Forum. Um, and we do that by librarians, by, by the state library, working with our public libraries to provide these conversations. We do it by teaming with businesses coming into our community colleges so they can learn the basics of it and then going into higher education. But the research is going on in higher education to inform this. And all along we have industry mentors and such. Right? That kind of massive new partnership is, I think that's a capability we can do. Right? We can have a conversation instead of, well, what are libraries going to do about this? You say, no, 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 no. 
what is your state going to do about this? Because we can help you do that. Um, and so, you know, we can have those broad conversations, but I think we have immediacy right now that we need to utilize and we also need to mitigate and we also need to inform, which are all our standard practices come back in this new mode. Yeah. Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson made it very I clear think that's to a, me. A great, excuse me, Stephen. I think that's a great closing uh, <laughs> statement from, from David there. We have run way over our hour and obviously we could run for hours more on various uh, topics, subtopics, branches, and so forth. And I think that's a good idea. I just don't think we can quite do it today. Uh, <laughs> I think it would be really, uh, really interesting to uh, articulate a set of AI-related services that libraries could provide. You just gave a great scenario there, David, that they could provide to their communities and explore each of those in some kind of depth to create something useful for, as a kind of a roadmap for libraries trying to understand their roles in this, this changed environment, which yep. they will and are. And thanks to uh, you, David, and, and Stephen as well, and all your great work and all the people that have come in today. I know you're out there doing something really, really wonderful for people. And I want to thank you, David, for taking the time today and sharing your perspectives and your experience. Uh, we've got another one in the can here. And this is great. So we're going to close it out with that and invite everybody back on November the 2nd for ITDRC and real disaster response. Uh, and with that, we'll sign off. Thank you all. Thanks, Don. I appreciate it.